So today we'll begin our unit on Buddhism. The image on the slide here is a painting by a contemporary American artist and comedian, Yoga Dog, whom I recommend to you. Um, he's got a pretty good website. It'll keep you busy for a while. Um, the image is reminiscent of Warhol, with whom many of you are probably familiar, but without any distortion to the central repeated figure, which is the head of the Buddha, modeled after a late 5th century sculpture from Uttar Pradesh. I like this image as a visual introduction to Buddhism because it can be seen to represent in a small way and through the artistic tradition the sort of inevitable transience that characterizes human experience. Um, and we'll come back to that and we will come back to this image. For now though, uh, we're going to take a look at the story of the Buddha. Um, so the story of Buddhism begins in the 6th century BCE, the time of the pre-Socratic philosophers in Greece like Heraclides and Anaximander and Anaximenes. Um, of Upanishadic development in India, which we've just looked at, of Cyrus the Great in Persia, of Confucius and Lao Tzu in China, which we'll turn to in the next unit. Buddhism is one more of those axial age traditions that we've talked about. Um, and it begins with a man, a fortunate man, who would become the first of today's three gems, or um, this, this set is known as the Triple Gem or the Three Refuges, Buddhism, like Christianity and Islam, is a missionary religion, and conversion is sort of correspondingly easy. Um, all you have to do to convert is to recite the three refuges with, again, full sincerity and honest commitment. Um, and we can see them here. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. Um, we'll get to each of these, but for today, we'll concentrate on the first, the Buddha. Uh, the word Buddha means enlightened one or awakened one. Um, you know, like Christ, Buddha is not a name. It's an honorific title, and it was a name that was given to a man whose accomplishments were seen to warrant it. So that man's name was Siddhartha Gautama, also known as Shakyamuni, or the, uh, the sage of the Shakya clan. Um, his standard, though, contested dates are 563 to 483 BCE. 563 to 483, and we're in the world of BCE. Um, he was the son of Kshatriya parents, which, remember, means that he was born into the warrior and ruler caste, uh, but not into, notably not into the caste of the spiritually elite, known as the Brahmins. His birth was accompanied by all kinds of auspicious signs, and this, uh, this image is a relief sculpture showing the circumstances surrounding the birth of the Buddha-to-be. Um, he was conceived when a white elephant entered this, his mother's side in a dream, and he was born not in the natural fashion, but again taken from the side of his mother. Um, as soon as he was born, he stood, he took seven steps in each direction, and, uh, and said something different each, each you know, one direction he says, Supreme I am in the world, greatest I am in the world, noblest I am in the world, never will I be reborn, right? And every direction that he walked in, every step he took, lotus flowers blossomed from the ground where he stepped. So, sort of a um, standard legendary birth tale of a religious uh, exemplar. But his mother died shortly after he was born. His father ruled a small state in the foothills of the Himalayas in Lumbini, or, uh, which is in modern-day Nepal. Um, and here's prayer flags in Lumbini, which is uh, uh, remains a very popular prayer or uh, pilgrimage site. Now remember that his father was a Kshatriya ruler and that he wanted the same sort of power and leadership for his son. But shortly after the boy's birth, a soothsayer tells the father, your son is going to be great. He's going to be amazing in either politics or in religion. He will either conquer armies and rule many people, many states, many nations, or he will conquer suffering and learn to rule the mind. And so his father, in the interest of channeling the boy's life into a life of political leadership, raises him within the palace walls, um, where he had everything he could ever want, and he knows nothing of suffering. That was the idea. That was the goal. And we sort of, you know, it seems a little, like, almost cruel on the part of his father, but we sort of have to, we have to appreciate this. The king, he was on to something here. Seeing, experiencing, knowing of suffering, that can push folks into... Um, into spiritual questions, and, and that's not what he wanted for his son. Uh, his, now, his father was a religious man, but he was also very practical. He wanted his son to be a king, uh, wanted his happiness and security, and so he shielded the boy. Um, three palaces, beautiful wife, beautiful son, whom, whom Siddhartha 
named Rahula, which means uh, fetter or like ball and chain. Um, but he couldn't rest contented. He couldn't, you know, he had everything he wanted, but he couldn't rest contented. He couldn't rest his mind. Uh, he begins to wonder how he got to this place he finds himself in, you know, what lies beyond the palace walls. Um, so this man, born into a high position in a stratified society, finds himself spiritually dissatisfied. There was in him a wanting without end, a sort of fundamental and seemingly inbuilt dissatisfaction. And this wanting wasn't sated by material goods. You know, he's, you say food. Okay, well, now you've got food. So how about good food? Well, now you've got good food. How about organic food? Cool, now you have organic food. How about locally grown organic food, right? And better locally grown organic food. And the, these are seen by many, you know, in, in, in our community and around the world to be good reasons to be motivated towards something, towards something better, to be, you know, to be moved, right? Um, but the reasons aren't in question for, for Buddhism. They weren't in question for Siddhartha. They're, what he realized is that there, you know, there can be good reasons. Uh, there often are. But the point is that there are always reasons, right? They don't go away. The idea of better or more seemed to Siddhartha to be part of his every dissatisfaction. And further, and, and worse, it seemed to be latent or waiting within his every satisfaction. The family, the food, the pleasure, you know, the, the, the music, the dancing girls, there was always in all of it the possibility for greater satisfaction. So what, what Siddhartha saw was that want, wanting, was structurally, not circumstantially, infinite. Um, that you couldn't sort of change your circumstances and all of a sudden want goes away. Oh, well, if I got that better organic food, I'll be cool, right? No, it was structurally, as a mechanism, it was structurally infinite. Um, so at age 29, he leaves the confines of the palace. His father reluctantly agrees to send him on something like a grand tour, um, though he first did all that was in his power to clear the way, to script the journey his son would take. Um, some stories have it that Siddhartha broke from the script by sneaking out of the palace before the time his father had planned, after a particularly um, robust party when everyone else was sleeping it off. Uh, later, especially Mahayana interpretations say that the gods conspired to disrupt the plans of the father to reveal to Siddhartha the suffering that he had not known. At any rate, while he is outside the palace walls, Siddhartha sees what have come within tradition to be known as the Four Sights. Um, this is what Prothero calls a truly momentous midlife crisis, and it ended the Buddha-to-be's spiritual blindness. Um, absolutely wrecked the illusion of ease with which he had been living pretty comfortably. Um, and the nature of the story highlights what will continue to be, and we'll see throughout the lectures, the tradition's emphasis on experience. Experience is a big deal for Buddhism. So here's what he sees. Here's an imagistic representation. First he sees a sick man, and we're sort of in this image going, um, you know, across the bottom you see these. He sees a sick man, which he had never seen before. Uh, you know, confined in the palace walls, it had been hidden from him. And he asks his charioteer and friend Chandra, he says, what is that, right? And Chandra responds, oh, that's a, that's a sick person. Each of us falls sick, you and I alike. No one is exempt from sickness, you know? And, you know, and the story repeats itself with an old man and then a dead man. Um, now, all, all three of these sights profoundly disturbed Siddhartha, who we can imagine must have been repulsed. Um, by all of this decay at the root of life itself. And and then he sees a sannyasin, uh, or a renunciant, the renunciant on the spiritual quest, whom Chandra tells him have, has cut off his attachment to the material trappings of this life um, in order to concentrate on spiritual truths, on, on, on how to get by in this world um, other than in physical ways, right? So seeing old age, sickness, and death, Siddhartha saw that we reach out to things and to people and to activities and even to ideas, many of them good, right, to get away from the constant falling away of the world from our grasp. You age, you fall ill, and you die. Everything ages, falls ill, and dies. And this is a very difficult truth. And so we turn to fun, you know, we'll turn to beer, to good beer, uh, to local organic microbrews, you know, or the great American lager, depending on your... Um, preference to escape, we, we turn to this sort of thing, to escape a sense of old age, sickness, and death. We turn to love, you know, and it can be to good love, to kind and strong lovers, to, gener uh, to lovers who are generous, generous in their affections and just in their estimations of us, right? We turn to them to forget old age, 
sickness and death, to feel for just a moment forever satisfied. Um, but we're not forever satisfied. The high wears off, the lover shows a side we've not seen, or develops a new interest, or maybe just the hormones stop pumping, and a new desire, a new wanting kicks in. And with the four sights, what the Buddha gets is a hint of all this. You know, he sees that he had been spiritually blind and decides that there must be more to life than power and pleasure. Uh, and he decides that he will find that something more, that he'll follow in the path of the sannyasin, that we saw that he will leave the palace. And the next day, in what tradition has dubbed the Great Departure, an act that's reenacted in ordination ceremonies around the world, Siddhartha leaves home. He walks to the edge of what would have been his inheritance, he shaves his head, he strips himself of his finery, and he takes up with a group of shramanas. And we've met these before, right? They're these wandering uh, ascetics. Um, and in an effort to get past wanting, he denies the body, as those wandering ascetic shramanas do. And and we do this, you know, this is this is all... It's a very psychological tradition that gets at a nature of human experience. We do this, as did the Buddha-to-be. You know, we deny the wanting, we deny the body, we practice severe austerities, you know, or we feed the mind, um, sit alone in a barren, empty room and listen to minimalist jazz, you know, or do Sudoku or whatever, um, or take off across North India and study with every ascetically-minded teacher available, you know, go on the Dharma trail, right? The Buddha-to-be did this, and he mastered every teaching he came across. He was eating little practicing austerities, and very, very thin. And that's what this image represents. Tradition has it that at this point he could sort of reach in from his tummy and grasp his um, spine from the front. Uh, but still he found there was a wanting, there was a thirsting, there was a hunger for wisdom or knowing or whatever is the opposite of material goods for something. There's always, always a wanting for something. Um, and so he sat, and sitting he came to this profound realization, profound and also simple, you know, intimidating almost in its simplicity, and he translated this profound realization into a teachable lesson, or a set of lessons. Um, for years he had been wandering with the five shramanas, whittling his body down until naked and half-starved, as in this picture, nearly dead, he realized that this was not going to work. Right? The more he disciplined his body, the more often and the more desperately it called out for food and sleep. Um, you know, there was something amiss. The extremity stopped him. Uh, he considered his path. You know, he the five shramanas at this point totally disappointed take off. They leave. And sticking, uh, you know, striking out on his own, the Buddha-to-be dedicates himself to the middle way um, between asceticism and indulgence, between starvation and luxury. And at age 35, after six years with the shramanas, he sat down. Um, having accepted a little bit of rice, and regained his strength so he wasn't going to die immediately, he sat down and he vowed not to get up until he f had found either death or liberation. Um, and where he sat was in Bodh Gaya, where there's now a massive temple and it's a great pilgrimage site. Um, and he sat under the Bodhi tree. It's at this point when he's relaxed his extreme desire that he's able to settle into a sense of realization that he begins to see clearly. And he sat for a long time, 49 days. Um, and here's pilgrims meditating under the Bodhi tree, which again is a great pilgrimage site. Now, during this time, Mara, the, uh, the Lord of Illusion, or the Demon Tempter, or the King of Demons, he tries to distract the Buddha to be, first with beautiful but false things like his three daughters. Uh, Mara's daughters are desire, aversion, which is kind of the opposite of desire and lust, which is something like the motor or the passion that drives all three, or that drives the other two. Um, and then when that doesn't work, Mara tries fire and brimstone, a demon army, but the Buddha-to-be remains unperturbed, so unperturbed, in fact, that if you look closely in this image, uh, that he turns, he, with his, the power of his meditational mind, turns the, uh, the weapons of the demon army into flowers. Um, and he reaches enlightenment, or nirvana, uh, which means to cool by blowing, or to, to, to blow out. Um, he has cooled the hindrances of greed, hatred, and delusion that bind us to samsara, and he reaches down to touch the earth, which itself bears witness to his enlightenment, his awakening, his becoming the Buddha. Um, so you see in this, in this small statue his hand reaching down. When you see that, and here's a very large one, um, in Sri Lanka, when you see the Buddha sit seated with his right hand down as though reaching to touch the ground, this is the moment of his awakening. That's what that represents. So next time we'll turn to the Buddha's first teachings.